I'm Nairi Woods and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. The Kyoto Prize was founded by Dr. Kazuo Inamori in Japan to celebrate the very best international achievements in science, in the arts and philosophy, and in technology. The prize is run by the Inamori Foundation and is held and celebrated in Kyoto every year, as well as here in Oxford. The award reflects Dr. Inamori's vision of a harmony between science and civilization and the enrichment of the human spirit. Sadly, we lost Dr. Inamori in 2022, but we're delighted to continue celebrating his vision with the Kyoto Prize here in Oxford each year. The Kyoto Prize celebrates the kinds of human achievements that humans can only achieve when they live in well-governed societies. And that's why here at the School of Government, we celebrate these brilliant scientists, technologists, people working in the fields of the arts and philosophy. These are things that well-governed societies permit human beings to do with excellence. The previous Kyoto Prize winners are a who's who of brilliant minds and human beings across the world. Primatologist Jane Goodall, the linguistics professor Noam Chomsky, the philosopher Bruno Latour, and this year we'll be celebrating three more. The Blavatnik School here at Oxford University is a school with a mission to support governments to improve and to make more flourishing communities for people across the world. The school does this by teaching, through research which is very applied and takes place alongside governments, and by engagement, by bringing people with very different points of view together and building unlikely coalitions to support human flourishing around the world. It's our great delight to have this collaboration with the Inamori Foundation and the Kyoto Prize, which celebrates the same kind of values, the humility and commitment to serving humankind all over the world. As Oxford University's Vice-Chancellor and a scientist myself, I understand the importance of collaboration and how it can lead to a deeper understanding of the world and ourselves. The University of Oxford is a seat of inspiration, a modern, research-driven and teaching university with an international focus for learning and a forum for intellectual debate. We are a place of excellence and we celebrate those whose hard work and values have led to world-class research. And just as our scholars are at the forefront in studying topics of worldwide interest from the dawn of the universe to the challenges of globalisation, so too the Kyoto Prize laureates are leaders in their respective fields, showing us a pathway to the scientific, cultural and spiritual betterment of mankind. We cherish our relationship with Japan and the Inamori Foundation. We are driven by a shared vision and are proud to host the Kyoto Prize at Oxford. Right, well, good afternoon. Um, I'm Nairi Woods, Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government. It's a particular delight to be back hosting in person the Kyoto Prize at Oxford and to be joined by Mrs. Inamori Kanazawa herself and by members of her wonderful team from the Inamori Foundation here in the Inamori Forum where the spirit of Dr. Kazuo Inamori lives on very strongly and we're very proud to take forwards. I'd like to introduce today's moderator and um, who, who will guide us through the first of our Kyoto Prize lectures this year, Professor, Professor Lionel Tarasenko, Professor of Engineering Science. Um, Lionel Tarasenko has changed the world of machine learning and healthcare from his base here at Oxford University. And he's also um, built and is leading Oxford's newest college, Reuben College. Lionel, such a pleasure to have you here. I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Nairi. And uh, thank you very much to the Inamori uh, Foundation for the support of this prize, which is um, a prize in advanced technology. Now, it's a great privilege for me to be introducing Professor Carver Mead, who joins us a little bit later on remotely from California today, because he has made, in the field in which I started in, which was electrical engineering, some of the more significant advances 
in microelectronics, which underpins what we now call the information age. And he's best known for proposing a new design methodology for very large-scale integrated circuits, VLSI circuits in silicon. And in fact, when I was chatting to him a few minutes ago, I reminded him that his book is the standard textbook for uh, advanced electronics in undergraduate uh, courses, including here in Oxford. And it was the textbook I used when I first started as an academic in the late 1980s. The late 1980s is a time when the electronics industry really took off. And this is mainly due to the rapid advances that were made in VLSI design, for which Professor Mead's work, not just his textbook, but the work that underpins it, paves the way. The smartphones that are in your pockets, and which I hope you've all uh, switched off, as well as the laptops that are in your bags, mm -hmm. um, uh, wouldn't be here without the major contributions that Professor Mead has made to the field of electrical engineering. And in fact, without VLSI chips known as GPUs, graphics processing units, we would not have ChatGPT today. Mm -hmm. Professor Mead, however, is much broader than that. I'm sure you will see this by the end of the lecture that he's about to, to give to us. He turned his extraordinary skills in electronic circuit design to create what we call neuromorphic electronic circuits. In other words, circuits that process information in the same way the brain does. Not ones and noughts, but what we call analog, circ uh, analog signals, which is the way the brains work. And he's made some extraordinary advances in that field too. But even that is not enough, and I could continue for uh, much longer if I had to list all of uh, Professor Mead's achievements. Um, which range from an extraordinary scale, from discovering how a single electron can tunnel through an energy barrier to controlling the flow of trillions of electrons in a VLSI chip. We are well, very honored to welcome him virtually today to the Blavatnik School of Government, and it is my privilege uh, now to give the stage over to him, Professor Carver Mead, the 2022 Kyoto Laureate in Advanced Technology. Over to you, Carver. Very good to be here. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, share this event with all of you, and uh, so we can we can start the video. Good to be here today. And I'm especially pleased with the, the young people here just starting a career. Uh, I want to talk to you today, uh, the rest of you. Uh, uh, the rest of you are welcome to listen in, but, but I, uh, I want to talk to the young people. My uh, colleague, the late Richard Feynman, said something that I think captures what uh, we're about in fundamental physical law. He said the real glory of science is that we can find a way of thinking such that the law is evident. If you look out on our discussions of fundamental physical law today, they're in the context of three great theories electromagnetism in the form of natural equations, uh, general relativity, which tells us all about gravitation, and uh, quantum mechanics and its offshoots that tell us about stuff down at the bottom. <laughs> when you look a little further at those theories, they're all over 100 years old. And we've learned a huge amount experimentally since they evolved in any meaningful way. So I want to share with you today some experiments, wonderful experiments have been done that to me make the law evident. So first of all, we should know what 
it means to be at the bottom. And quantum things are at the bottom level that we know about. And what does it mean for something to be quantum? It means just one thing. It means the wave nature of matter. And we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of that great insight by Louis de Broglie, 100 years ago this year. What's down at the bottom is not little grains of sand or little bullets, it's waves. So it's funny to be talking about waves in San Diego. <laughs> but uh, I mean a little more, uh, something a, a little further down from what you could see. And I know uh, a lot of you here are experts on that subject, but. Uh, if you could just forgive me for a minute for doing a little primer on what waves are about. This is a view of a wave, and uh, it's propagating from left to right. And uh, I have it instrumented. So over here on the right, there's an instrument that measures the uh, value of the wave coming out on the right-hand side. And down here at the bottom, it measures the amplitude of the wave looking at it from the side. And this is a small chunk out of a wave that's many, many wavelengths in dimensions crosswise. And uh, what do we mean by all uh, this? Well, the, um, the wave has a frequency, which we see, it's the rate at which this amplitude of the wave wiggles and it has a wavelength. And so there's a vector that goes with every wave. Uh, the vector direction is obvious. The direction of propagation is perpendicular to the wave front, the way the wave is going. And the wavelength is just the distance it takes to go one wave down here. Uh, but the strength of the wave is actually how many waves there are per unit distance. And that's called the wave vector, or in ordinary units, it's called the momentum. So the way, rate at which the wave wiggles its frequency is called energy when it's a matter wave. And the number of wavelengths per unit distance is called the momentum. And the momentum is a vector which is in the direction that the wave is propagating. Now, we're gonna be doing some experiments with waves. The first thing you do is you put up something that stops the wave. This particular one absorbs the wave, so nothing gets through it. And nothing goes onto the other side, so you don't see any amplitude coming out here. But we can cut holes in it, and you can see the wave propagating. And you notice it doesn't keep going straight through like a little bullet would. Uh, it spreads out from here. And if you cut two slots in the barrier, you get the famous two-slit experiment. It's in all the textbooks about quantum things. And what you notice is that uh, on the other side, there are angles like the straight-through angle, which there are no waves on the left that go straight through. But the effect of these two waves adding up together has a maximum going straight through, and then you go off a little bit, and the distance from the top slot is just 180 degrees of phase, phase being the distance along the wave. Um, it's just 180 degrees out of phase with the wave from the bottom slot. And so there's another angle Go back to this one. So there's another angle here, 
where you get a maximum. And in between, they interfere with each other. The two waves add up out of phase. And so the whole pattern here that you measure out on the edge is called an interference pattern. And we'll see a lot of those. Uh, and uh, the thing you notice about the interference pattern is uh, this is a high frequency wave uh, and it's uh, wiggling and fast. And this is the angle that it, uh, that it makes for the first maximum aside from the one going straight through. But if I have a lower frequency wave, lower energy wave, longer wavelength wave, that angle's bigger. So it's wiggling slower, so it's a lower energy, longer wavelength, so it's lower momentum, and it has a bigger angle, and we'll see that. Uh, you can see it going back and forth between the top one and the bottom one, the angle to the maximum for the low frequency long wavelength wave is higher than it is for the higher frequency, higher energy, higher wave vector, higher momentum wave. Now, of course, that all works in two dimensions as well. If you shine a wave through a crystal, you get maxima at these maxima in two dimensions. And here's the straight through one down here, and here's one where in both directions the uh, things add up, right? And in 1927, just four years after de Broglie said matter was waves, the people at Bell Labs went and made a wonderful measurement, uh, made a big vacuum arrangement, had an electron beam, and uh, and they found out that, sure enough, here's a electron beam that has 65 volts. That's 65 electron volts of energy per electron. And so the electrons bounced off the planes in the crystal. <laughs> and the maximum, one of those bright spots, in the maximum at 44 degrees. But if they lowered the voltage down to 54 degrees. Then they found that spot went out to 50 degrees. So sure enough, worked just like you'd expect for a wave that had a momentum, which was how many <coughs> waves there are per unit distance, and had a energy, which was the frequency, how fast the thing wiggled. Well, 50 years later, there was an amazing experiment done. And I want to tell you about experiments that were done in the 60s and 70s, because the people that made up our great theories didn't see any of these. And these experiments tell us how the waves work. We already saw the first one that said that the energy of the wave changed its angle in just the right way. <clears throat> this experiment, a little bit harder to explain, but let me go through it because it's such a fundamental experiment, we'll need to understand it. This is a single crystal of silicon, which you could get in 1975, and they cut out chunks of it so that you had these three fins sticking up, and the fins are just thick enough. So a neutron that's coming along, neutron wave, would have a straight through path here. That was the center spot that we saw, and has a spot off to the side, the diffracted spot that goes off at this angle. And now we have another part of the neutron. This is one neutron at a time. So the neutron wave, splits into two. It's still the same neutron. Nothing funny about that. If it was a particle, that would be terribly, terribly disturbing. It's not. It's a wave. You can spread out if it needs to. 
this one felt like it. So here's the part of the neutron going this way, and now it gets diffracted again. And here's the straight through path, and here's the diffracted path. So I have that path, A, C, D, ends up at this spot on the right, and there's another path, the neutron goes straight through here and then diffracts on this one, A, B, D, and they both add up here at point D. Well, when they're adding up, they're either gonna add up together in phase, means they're twice as big, or they can cancel out each other when they're out of phase. So the counts you get out here in these counters are going to reflect how the waves are adding up in or out of phase. And now the trick here, which was so beautiful, this whole thing is mounted in a metal box that's all nice and rigid so that you can rotate it around this axis shown here at, with the angle phi. And when you do that, you're in the Earth's gravitational field. So uh, if you turn the thing clockwise, like it's shown there, this part of the path up here, CD, is gonna be higher in the Earth's field than path AB. And so the neutrons are gonna have, to, the ones that are diffracted here, are gonna have to climb the hill of gravitational potential to get to the level up here at CD. Well, if they're gonna have to climb the hill, their, their energy is conserved and they have a kinetic energy coming in. That's why they're waving fast. So if they're going uphill, they give up some of that kinetic energy and turns into potential energy. So the gravitational potential higher up is higher. That means the kinetic energy is lower, which means it'll have a longer wavelength. So it'll get out of phase with its partner that came around ABD. And as you gradually rotate in the Earth's gravitational field, you see the waves adding up in phase here and out of phase here. This was a fantastic experiment. It directly shows that the neutron wave has as a part of its momentum, the gravitational potential. And that's a thing we will see over and over again. Now, it gets better than that. If that was all there was, everyone would say that's obvious. But that's not all there is. You have two paths that the neutron splits into. So there's a path going around A, C, D, and a path going on A, B, D. And suppose I kept them flat with respect to the gravitational field, but I rotated them. Well, if it's the whole thing's rotating, then the neutron, the half of the neutron that goes A, C, D, it's got further to go because it's got to catch up with D because the B has moved a little bit. And the one that's going this way, D has come a little closer. So this one will take less phase delay and that one will take more. So there should be a vector effect. Well, what would the vector effect come from? Well, if you're in the frame of reference of the neutron, there's a big universe out there. And the matter in the universe, the effect on the potential goes like one over the distance, but the amount of matter goes like the square of the distance. So the effect on us of matter out in the universe gets bigger as the matter is further away. So most of the matter that affects us here when we do our experiments is very far out. 
in the universe. Well, they did that experiment. How are you going to arrange it so that you can rotate it so smoothly that it doesn't it, it's got a big effect of the Earth's gravitational field. How are you going to get rid of that? Well, what they did is they mounted it on a post like this, and they could still turn it around. But if the perpendicular here to this ABDC plane is got a projection on the rotation of the Earth, you just let the earth turn it around. That's nice and steady as it gets. And if you have it turned one way, if the perpendicular to that plane is aligned with the rotation vector of the earth, then you'll get a phase shift in one direction. And if you turn it 180 degrees so that the perpendicular is anti-aligned with the Earth's rotation, you'll get the opposite phase. Well, they did that. And here it is right here. If you point the, the vector north, it's aligned with the rotation of the Earth, and you get a positive phase shift. It's uh, not quite a, a full cycle, but it's 100 degrees. And if you point the thing west, then the thing is just goes around, but it doesn't rotate. So it doesn't register any fascia. And then if you have a thing back up the other way, then it's rotating the other way as the Earth rotates relative to the distant universe. And so, in fact, in a very rough way, we've established that this neutron wave, the vector part that's directional, knows where the universe is. Well, that's a direct message from the neutrons. It's telling you, it's making its law evident. Well, not many of us can afford a source of neutrons, and the, the setup itself was pretty complicated, so we're not going to have one of those in a freshman physics lab. But there are things we could do in a freshman physics lab that tell us just as clearly what the wave nature of matter is doing. Now, you've all seen pictures like this. First thing you learn about electricity is you take a battery, has some voltage, and you hook it up to a chunk of something or other, and uh, it makes a current go through there, and the current is proportional to the voltage divided by the resistance of the stuff. So it resists the electrons flowing. And that means the velocity of the electrons is linear in the electrical field, electrical field pushing on them, and they go at a distance. That's thousand-year-old thinking. That's the way they used to think mechanics worked. You had to push something along to keep it moving. And it wasn't until Galileo had his nice marble slabs that he showed that it still had its kinetic energy that came from the potential energy of letting it roll down a, a marble slab. So what have you done to the electrons? You've put them in something that completely scatters their wave nature, makes it all random. And so they can't propagate in a nice way that electrons want to do unless you mess them up. So a horrible way to learn about what electrons are like. The electron should, it's 
acceleration should depend on the electrical field, not its velocity. Well, turns out that's what happens if you make an environment for the electrons that doesn't mess them up. That was first done in 1911 uh, in Leiden, just a little town south of Amsterdam. And a guy by the name of Camerlionis. And he was dutifully measuring Ohm's law here. Here's a resistance in ohms, that's that omega there, and that's very low. You can see it's a 0.15 of an ohm. And uh, this is a wire of mercury. Mercury, of course, is liquid metal at uh, room temperature, but you can make it in the shape you want and then cool it and turns it into a solid. So it's very uh, convenient to use for low temperature measurements because you can make any ring shape you want. And he noticed that he was coming down here, cooling. He was the first guy that figured out how to liquefy helium, which happens around four degrees absolute. And so he was bumping on his helium here, making it colder and colder, and bang, the resistance went away. Well, of course, he figured out it, something in his setup had broken. Uh, the volt, yeah, voltmeter wasn't hooked up anymore. And so he was hunting around trying to figure out what had gone wrong. In the process, uh, he wasn't pumping so much on the helium and it started to warm up a little and bang, the resistance came back. Well, he's a smart guy. So he said, if I can go back and forth reproducibly, that means it's a real physical effect. But it gets to a resistance which is way lower than anything I can measure. So what do I do? How would I find out what it is? Well, a smart, smart guy, he said, I'm gonna take the mercury and I'm gonna make it into a ring. This ring here, it goes underneath this apparatus there. So that's a continuous ring of mercury that they cooled down. And uh, he found a way to, he, he reasoned like this. If I can get a current started in the ring, it'll make a magnetic field. And I can tell if there's a magnetic field there by putting a compass down there. They're ordinary, old-fashioned magnetic compass. So he did. He got the thing superconducting. He got a current started in it. And the compass went from pointing north here to pointing east. And he expected it to die out within seconds or maybe minutes. He kept pumping on his helium overnight, and it was still going just as strong. The most significant physical experiment ever been done. This is perpetual motion. Never been anything like that. There, to this day, isn't anything like that. It's a perfect frictionless system. Well, people puzzled over this, and then a couple decades later, the London brothers said, it must be a coherent quantum system, a macroscopic quantum system, because that's the only way it could work, because if it's a quantum system, it's a wave, and the wave goes around, and it has to come back in phase with itself. So unless you break it, and there's 10 to the 23rd electrons in it, and so the little thermal wiggles that happen at 4 Kelvin aren't going to do anything to something with 10 to the 23rd electrons in a coherent quantum state macroscopic wave of matter. Unbelievable. This teaches us, us about matter waves in a way that nothing else we've ever had can do. Well, it took another 50 years. It's astounding. This is an experiment Onus could have done and didn't think of it. Uh, there's a group in Germany, 
uh, and another group in uh, Stanford here in California did uh, their uh, their findings were were published in the same issue of the journal Physical Review Letters in 1961. And what they did is they had a, a this is a little ring. They used lead. Lead's a good superconductor too. And uh, they found a way to trap a current in it when it went superconducting. And then once it had a little current in it, instead of using a compass, well, a compass is a big clunky thing, but you do the other thing. You turn the little current thing, you hang it on a spider web so that it can rotate with a very little bit of force. And you put a very weak magnetic field on it. So you've turned the sample itself into the needle of the compass. So it's not so different from Onus's measurement. And uh, how much that angle changes as you put the little very weak magnetic field on from outside tells you what the magnetic moment is. Well, what's a magnetic moment? Well, this tells you in a way that's evident. The magnetic moment is the wave comes around in phase with itself. Well, that can be in phase with no f phase change around the loop or with one cycle phase change around the loop or with two cycles phase. In. That's what these are. The flux is quantized. The magnetic moment is quantized. What that is, is the wave vector of the electron condensate, this magic, perfect, frictionless phase of matter. The phase comes around and it must come around in phase with itself. And that phase is quantized. So this is where the term quantum comes from. It's the reason that the energy levels of an electron, a single electron in an atom, comes around in phase with itself. And that gives it, it can be one phase, zero. No, electron can't be zero because it's got this complicated thing called spin that we still don't understand very well. So all of the quantum levels of things come about because matter is waves. And the waves have to come around and phase for themselves. Well, that last experiment could have been done by Camerlingonis, and you can certainly do it in a freshman physics lab. Here's another one you can do in a freshman physics lab. The London's predicted if you had a ring of superconductor and you spun the ring, you would get a magnetic field. What in the world is that about? Here I have this frictionless stuff, and it's in a ring that has positive charges because, of course, those electrons came with the atoms that made the ring, and they just happened to get free and gang up and make this wonderful condensate. And that's a frictionless thing, but there's still a positive charges there. So when you spin the ring, you have the positive charges go around, well, now, if the electrons would go exactly with the positive charges, there wouldn't be any current because electrons going that way would be a negative current. Positive charges going that way would be a positive current. They cancel out. But that's not what happens. As you spin the ring faster, the magnetic flux gets bigger. What in the world is that about? I have a perfect electron condensate, frictionless, and it's got no flux in it, no twist in its wave function as it goes around. So the wave has the same phase all the way around. Now, what's in the world 
is it doing that it becomes a magnetic field? Well, think about it this way. If I start the ring rotating, I start the positive charges, the electron condensate is a free-floating thing, but it feels the magnetic vector coupling with the positive charges going around, so it has to speed up to keep up with the positive charges. Well, you would think then it's perfect, so it ought to just keep up perfectly. What well, doesn't? It lags behind. So as you accelerate to make the ring spin, it has to accelerate relative to the universe. So when you're not moving, you're not spinning the ring relative to the universe, there's no magnetic flux. The electrons are perfectly lined up with the positive charges. But when you spin them, there's no mechanical coupling. The, the condensate is a perfect thing, but it's charged and it has mass. It has the quantity of matter that couples gravitationally. So this is a perfect experiment that has the vector coupling of the positive charges moving, which we call magnetism. And it has the vector coupling of the from the point of view of the electron condensate, it's the universe out there going around. So it induces what we call inertia in the matter. And here's a perfect example where there's no friction to get in the way. And this can be done in a freshman physics lab. Well, those are experiments that make the law evident. What about light? Light's just one way of a matter wave one place that's charged, talking to a matter wave someplace else that's charged. Maybe it will have some coupling to gravitation. It's funny, uh, Einstein struggled with this question never quite settled to the end of his life. In 1911, he had a wonderful, simple, clear theory where the velocity of light was a function of the gravitational potential. Interesting. Then in 1915, he crafted, with a lot of help, a very much more complicated and very much more obscure theory of gravitation uh, called general relativity. And general relativity has two things. It has an equation, uh, a sort of wave-like equation uh, for the gravitational potential, which is reasonably easy to understand if you take the simple case, and it has a stipulation that you guess what function light speed is of the gravitational potential. And that's something you have to put in in addition to the theory. It's just a, the math doesn't tell you that. You just have to guess it. Well, he changed his mind and he guessed that it was going to be independent of gravitational potential. And that statement, that choice, has doomed us to work in curved space-time ever since. So if you put matter in your space, a meter isn't a meter anymore. It's a nightmare. You can do it. The smartest people of the world I know have made that work. But you have to change the coordinate system in order to do it from the coordinate system that says light is 
constant speed, no matter where you are in a frame of reference which isn't accelerated or rotating. Well, let's look at what, I'm an engineer. Let's do the measurement. Erwin Shapiro in the late 60s was at MIT and they had a, an old uh, radio astronomy antenna there that wasn't used very much. It's called the Haystack Observatory. And he was good at doing experiments, so he got put together a real high power radar. He had the antenna, you shoot out a, a microwave signal out of the antenna and you'll wait for an echo to come back. And he got good at getting echoes from uh, Mars and Venus. Well, Mars and Venus have their inner planets, so they have faster periods than the Earth. And so when we watch them, they occasionally go real close to the sun. And so when they do, uh, he measured the delay. And there's this huge increase in the delay when the radar signal goes next to the sun. And guess what? It's exactly the form that you would calculate if the speed of light was proportional to the gravitational potential. Very interesting. Now, you can either calculate that curve the hard way by assuming the speed of light is constant and then changing into a coordinate system where it's doing what it's doing, really and physically. Or you can just say, I'm gonna work in the system where it's doing what it's doing makes everything a lot simpler. So we've discovered that light has an effect on gravitation, or said the other way, gravitation has an effect on light. This is a scalar effect. It's a gravitational potential changes the speed then if all is like the neutrons, should have a vector effect. Well, guess what? Uh, right now, inertial navigation is not done with old mechanical whirling gyroscopes anymore. It's done with fiber optic gyroscopes because you can start light. This is a wonderful device. You start with a laser. And this thing called B here is a beam splitter. It spits half the light off at 45 degrees and the other half goes straight through. So this beam comes in, it goes up. Half of it goes up, half of it goes straight. So now we have two halves of the light beam going in opposite direction around these many turns of the coil. And when they get to the other end, they come back and they combine here the one from the top goes straight down. The one from over here bounces off and goes down. And so they add up at the detector, just like the neutrons did. And guess what? You get a really nice pattern, an interference pattern, if you rotate this. So you can buy these things. Uh, here's a commercial one that has one coil of fiber optic. It's just what's shown here. And uh, this is a complete three-axis gyroscope. So it has three of these things that mounted on the three orthogonal uh, axes. And so what you can do is you can put this on your, uh, the uh, mounting surface of your astronomical telescope. And it has motor drives, so you can tune the motor drives until all three axes read zero. And then you go look through your telescope. And the distant galaxies are stationary. Don't try to tell me that's an accident. That's the vector coupling. 
of the distant universe. Well, you've all been told that there is no preferred frame of reference, and that's just wrong. Looking at the experiments, it's clear there is a frame of reference, and that's the distant mass in the universe. <clears throat> well, then how can special relativity work? Einstein made very clear, if you're moving in a straight line, not rotating and not accelerating, you can be any velocity in any direction, and you get an equivalence in the results that you get in a local experiment. How can that possibly be true when we're moving in a vast potential of the universe? Well, let's look at the universe. We're living in an accelerating universe. And by now, we know a lot about that by observing. And one of the things Hubble figured out in 1922 is that the things furthest away are moving away from us the fastest. That's Hubble's law. Well, if you take that literally, you go further and further, and finally you get to where they're moving away from us at the speed of light. Well, that means that we can't see them anymore. Can't, light can't get back to us, and gravitational interaction can't get back to us. So that means that all, all cosmologies have a horizon. It's that distance when the stuff is moving away from us at the velocity of light. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, what it means is if I look in any direction, the stuff's moving away, and it looks like it's further stuff is moving faster. Well, suppose I'm moving towards one of the horizons in a straight line, not accelerating, it means that horizon moves away from me. I'm catching up with the matter. So the horizon moves away from me, and the one behind moves it. So it means that the effect of the universe, as long as it's pretty much the same beyond the horizon as it is this side of the horizon, it means that if you're moving at any velocity, the horizon just moves around a little bubble with you. That's why special relativity works. It's not just a mathematical thing. It's physics in it. Uh, coupling with the universe that's moving away, and most of it's moving at near the velocity of light, then you get that the local experiments don't know about moving in a straight line because the universe that you can feel and see moves with you. It all makes sense. It's a way of thinking that makes the law evident. So let's think about the history of the universe. It started out much denser than it is now. And so it had a lot of kinetic energy. Otherwise, it wouldn't be continuing to expand. But gravitation is an attractive thing. So it means that to separate matter takes energy. So as you're separating the elements of matter, like they have little rubber bands between every two elements of matter, and as you universe expands, a stretch in those rubber bands. The gravitational potential is that gravitational potential due to the attraction of all matter with all other matter within the horizon. That's the potential of every element of matter. Guess what? Einstein said, the energy is mc squared. 
That's the rest energy of matter. 100% of that rest energy is gravitational potential. And every element of matter has inertia. You have to put energy in to accelerate it. 100% of that inertia is a gravitational vector coupling. So if we just take what the universe is telling us, <clears throat> the laws, the fundamental laws are evident. Now I'm talking to the young people here today. You won't hear this very many places, but compared with wading through the layers and layers of opaque mathematics in the three great theories that are out there, it's vastly easier. You can do everything I've talked about today with trigonometry and first year calculus. <clears throat> You're the ones that can find a new way of thinking and turn it into a real theory that makes real predictions. One of the things you'll find right away is you see questions that make sense in this way of looking at it that you can't even ask in the traditional theories. To try to find something new to do with the traditional theories, hundred years of the smartest people in the world working on them, they work most of the problems. Not much left for you to do. You look at things in a new way, there's a huge number of things we don't understand, but the big theories shield them from you. In quantum mechanics, when you ask about, well, what makes the wave function collapse? They say, oh, you can't ask that question. I remember being told that when I was an undergrad. I said, what do you mean I can't ask that question? I just did. <laughs> well, you can ask questions. You can become leaders in learning about the results of <clears throat> looking at physical law through the eyes of these wonderful experiments that make the laws evident. So go out there and do it. Bless you. Thank you very much, Donald. He's back on the screen. Um, so that is the question time. Um, and remember that uh, all the experiments that Professor Mead described, I think, are at least 50 years old. Um, so um, are there any new experiments that people here would like to do? Um, are there any questions from the young people? Um, are there any questions from the older physicists amongst the audience? There's one question from a, a remote guest, so we'll look at those as well. But who wants to start here um, and ask Professor Mead a question. Anybody keen to ask a question? I, I have a very simple question here to, uh, to ask from somebody remotely in the audience, but I just thought um, if there was anybody here where there was um, anything you want Professor Mead to elucidate as he goes from the single electron all the way through the universe. Um, any, any questions that uh, become obvious at whatever scale of matter he was talking about? Um, or um, there's a question here about a career in physics. Um, now we have a number of young people here in the audience. Any of you interested in Career in physics. Um, so, I, I have one question to get you going, uh, Carver. While people think of other questions, um, 
the physicist stroke philosopher, um, John Wheeler, once said, um, the answer is determined by the questions that you ask. Um, how true do you think that is? We need to put the volume on for Professor Mead. We can see you, but we can't hear you at the moment. Yes. Can you hear me now? Good. Yeah, we Good. can hear you now. Yes. In a way, uh, that's a tautology. Uh, of course, asking the question is already a way of thinking. Uh, otherwise, uh, the question wouldn't occur to one. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, fields as they grow old tend to ossify uh, around the viewpoint with which they were started 100 years before. Uh, our three gate theories were start, all started in a, a mechanical age where the thinking was very mechanical. And if you go back, to the history of electromagnetism, for example, or, uh, right where you are, they were struggling with uh, the ether and what kind of mechanical stuff could there be in the vacuum that would cause things to propagate in the way they do. Uh, so there was a, a huge burden of mechanical thinking uh, that naturally formed the concepts that then became electrical. And we're still, in fact, trapped with that in the way that electromagnetism is taught. Uh, and it's certainly uh, the, the things you can ask in, uh, in gravitation are limited by the, the uh, metric way in which uh, uh, people look at gravitation, uh, even though Einstein had a broader view himself. So yes, uh, certainly we're limited by the questions we can ask, which are uh, imposed upon fields by its trajectory through history. Okay, well I have one for the questions that they're beginning to come in. Uh, remotely, it's quite a complicated one, um, but let me ask a question which uh, when I used to teach quantum mechanics to second year engineers in Oxford, I always used to, to get. So we did start with the experiment that you mentioned, uh, the electron diffraction experiment from 100 years ago. So I used to tell them, first of all, that it's not actually de Broglie, uh, as you may think, um, because um, he's a very interesting character. He was a prince and he was French, and actually his name is not pronounced de Broglie in French, it's pronounced as de Breuil. But if you talk about de Breuil in an Oxford tutorial, nobody understood, so I had to use the English mispronunciation of his name as Louis de Broglie um, with his experiment to show that um, it, uh, the electron behaved as a wave. And of course, I think it's still true that he's the only person whose PhD directly led to him being awarded a Nobel Prize in physics. It was actually his PhD thesis. Um, and you can correct me, Carver, if I've got that wrong, but I think it was true certainly when I used to teach it to the Oxford undergraduates. But because I was teaching engineers and they were familiar with their school, so th we're talking about secondary school here, experiments, where the electrons behaved as particles. They wanted to know, they would ask, always ask me the question, but Lionel, nobody called me doctor or professor Tarasega, they all called me Lionel. Lionel, but is the electron a wave or is it a particle? I need to get an answer before I leave this tutorial. So how would you have answered that question, Carver? <clears throat> well, it's very clear that these elements of matter are waves but they have the property that if you integrate their density over all space of each individual one, it integrates to one electronic charge or one uh, rest energy. And so the mystery, which is just assumed away by having it be a point particle, 
the mystery is uh, these things are manifestly waves, but what is it about them that gives it each one its identity? Mm -hmm. uh, they don't, you, you make a beam of electrons uh, and there's still a what we electrical engineers would call noise uh, that they have as the individual ones interact with whatever they're interacting with, uh, you get a click in the Geiger counter. So you say, oh, that was a particle. What is it that causes the uh, individuals to have individuality? That's deeply mixed up with uh, the property of spin, which, as I mentioned, we don't really understand at the bottom. We don't understand uh, what it is that causes certain kinds of elements of matter to interact with each other in such a way that they can be in the same state or not be in the same state. The thing we call the Pauli principle, uh, we don't understand that. Uh, it's been papered over by some very fancy uh, mathematics at the cost of working in three n dimensional space where n is the number of electrons. Well, the electrons don't live in three n dimensional space. The electrons live in ordinary three dimensional space. And we never learn how to treat them in ordinary three dimensional space because we had this math trick that Heisenberg invented in order to get the helium atom, which had two electrons in closely related states, opposite spins, uh, we never got to the bottom of that. Uh, we never got to the bottom of why Schrodinger used the uh, complex number to get a phase on a thing that's otherwise uh, uh, has no particular properties, uh, except that it integrates to one. Um, that's obviously too simple to have a spin. And so what do we do? Well, we could go back and we could try to understand that. That's a question you can ask if you treat the electron as a wave, but you can't ask in the present uh, multidimensional space. So what we've done is we've continually added mathematical complexity to hide the fact that we never got to the bottom of what the wave function really is and what the spin really is and why it has the Pauli principle with its fellow electrons. And until we do that, we're not gonna make progress. And that was the message I had for the young people. Thank you very much, Kava. That's a great answer. I'm not sure my second year um, engineers at Oxford would be fully satisfied with it. They might be quite cross still as they leave the tutorial, but um, I, I will make sure that we record this clip and make it available to second year engineers puzzling over these very points. Um, has anybody in the audience come up with a question since we... Yes, please. Thank you. So there's a microphone, maybe, so that uh, Professor Mead can hear you. Um, this might be a very simple question, but um, I was just wondering, as you're one of the pioneers um, with the very large scale integration um, in semiconductors, what you think um, the implications of the new quantum mechanic theories that have come up, and um, especially quantum computing are for the semiconductor industry, as we see that this has become an essential part in the chip wars currently going on, um, and overall the importance of semiconductors with the uh, energy transition. I hope that was clear. <laughs> Did you hear that? Uh, uh, yeah, that's, it's uh, clear that quantum computing is formulated in this very ad hoc multidimensional space because we haven't understood at the bottom how to treat quantum things in ordinary space. Uh, 
once we are able to do that and the young people like yourself would be uh, perfect for pursuing an understanding of this sort, um, quantum computing will look quite different. Uh, I'm not uh, going to speculate on how it will look, but a lot of the a lot of the impetus for doing quantum computing is because it's postulated that nothing is simpler than the three dimensional space that they have it working in today. Um, we will certainly in the future find a way to work with the electron in ordinary three dimensional space. So you can imagine what that quantum computing will look quite differently when we do that. To follow up on that, no, do you want to follow up on that question? Uh, okay, I have one question. I think we have about, yes, one question in the back and then there's one remote that I will ask. And it's had an incredible impact on uh, human civilization, if I may say. How do you see the role of policymakers in shaping technology and innovation policy going forward, given the uncertainties at both quantum level and at a geopolitical level? Lionel, can you help me with that? Uh, so, is it a more kind of political question about geopolitical? Um, the center of gravity of research moving away from, say, so maybe a bit and more slowly, sorry. The role of policy making in enabling such innovations uh, as we have seen in the past hundred years, how do we move forward uh, as policy makers because they are often said to be, you know, lagging behind technology. How do we work together with uh, scientists and innovators to shape policy that can uh, enable more innovations and making sure that its benefits are equally distributed? Uh, Lionel, can you? Yeah, so it's the question, it's a fairly broad question and uh, there's one more question to ask, so maybe a fairly short answer, Carver. It's how, when you look at the complexity for most of the audience here, I mean, I think you, you describe them as simple principles, but to make them simple, you had to deal with very complex um, phenomena that not necessarily everybody could understand in the room. Uh, the Blavatnia School of Government trains policymakers. How do policymakers understand the complexities that you were describing, and how do they feed? How do you feed the kind of thing you were talking about in your lecture into policy making for? scientific research and scientific education? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, fields tend to get uh, trapped in their uh, conceptual history. And it's very hard. Uh, but there are always people who find a way of thinking for themselves. And all of us who have made progress in the world have had to find ways of thinking for ourselves. And there's no national boundaries for talented people that think for themselves. Now we've got a final question because I should really um, allow one remote question. And this is quite a tough topic, but the challenge for you, uh, Carver, is to try and answer it in a couple of minutes. Um, so what is your view, um, this uh, remote listener is asking, on quantum entanglement? Well, um, I've uh, just in the COVID time in 2020, I wrote a paper with John Kramer, who many of you know as the person who uh, introduced the idea that uh, electromagnetic coupling has a bidirectionality to it, a non-locality to it. 
And uh, we wrote a paper together, which is on archive, so you can all look it up. And uh, the, the simple answer is that you can get all of the results that uh, John Clauser got uh, for his uh, recent Nobel Prize um, with the kind of thinking that I uh, am putting forward. It turns out is not difficult and you can, uh, once again, you can do it with ordinary mathematics. You don't have to get into three n dimensional space or any of that. And so I would invite you to, to read the, the closing sections of that paper where Clauser's uh, initial non-locality uh, findings were developed. Great. Well, I will actually ask one final question because I think it's a good one for us to think about. Most of the experiments that you showed uh, and the names that you showed from Einstein to Du Bois and others were Nobel Prize winners. We're not all going to be Nobel Prize winners. Um, what, when you were the age of some of these people, even earlier in your teens, what got you to think about um, going for physics, electronics, and so on, in terms of what you would study? What, what is the drive when you're way uh, miles away from being able to think at the level of these Nobel Prize winners? The idea that got you to, to think about, I really want to get into physics, I really want to get into electronics. What was the big drive then, is it, and is it still valid for young people, teenagers today, say, or young undergraduates? That's a great question. I uh, personally, I've always had a terrible aversion to things that seem to me to be much more complicated than is true of the thing itself. That it has had layers and layers of complication put on it by certain ways of thinking. And I've always, because I couldn't keep up with those complexity of those ways of thinking. I had to develop a simple way of understanding what uh, people had made very complicated. So in fact, it was just that determination on my part to understand in my own way how these things work that led to the work on, on uh, electronic devices and and to electromagnetic things and, and all of that. So my advice to the young people is you've got to find a way of thinking so that it's evident to you. It reminds me, and I think I'll have to paraphrase because I can't remember the exact quote, but somebody you mentioned at the beginning of your lecture, Richard Feynman, I think once said, if you can't explain it in simple terms, you don't understand it. Um, right. So I think on that thought and um, your great answers to the questions and your wonderful lecture, Carver, we'd like to thank you again for um, your time with us today. Thank you.